This is Real to Real Podcast. Real stories, real sports. And here's your host, Wu Bay Gabre. Welcome to season two of Real to Real. And I dug deep in the crates for this one. I'm so honored to have this young man on my show, one of the greatest sportscasters, not only in the Hampton Roads area, but all in the all over the country. He's the one of the most revered and respected sportscasters out there. He has more than 45 years in broadcasting. He was the longest active uh, television anchor in Hampton Roads history. He was the first person inducted into the Hampton Roads Sports Media Hall of Fame. He's in the Hampton Sports Media Hall of Fame. I mean, Hampton Roads Sports Hall of Fame. And most recently, the Virginia Sports Hall of Fame. And we talked about this off air, CIAA Hall of Fame, which I did not know. He has covered so many events uh, like the 96, the 2000, the 2004 Olympics. He's covered the Washington back then, the Washington Redskins, the Washington football team. Uh, he's raised over a million dollars for St. Jude uh, Hospital with the golf tournament. And he he's now has a new gig. And we're going to talk about everything under the sun with the myth, the man, the myth, the legend, Mr. Bruce Raider. Bruce, I know you're busy, my man. I really appreciate you spending some time with me, man. Hey, only for you, only for you. Well, not only for you, but especially. For you. <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm you on the tree somewhere. Time. I'm on the tree somewhere. Well, because see, see, I won't, I won't tell anybody. I knew you win. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I back in the win. day, so, I was, I was I'm very uh, proud. I'm very proud of you and all of the, all of the young men and women that uh, I was uh, able, in a very small way, to help mentor a little bit. Uh, I, I. What I do is I tape the L.A. version of Sports Center on ESPN right. when I wake up in the morning. You know, I know that the L.A. Sports Center, everything's finished when they do there. So I don't have to wait till that seven o'clock East Coast one. And Stan Verrett is the anchor of the L.A. Sports Center. And he was with me for years. Yep. And actually, I got him his very first day uh, that he was on TV. It was, it was either a Christmas Eve or something right. like that. And nobody wanted to work. And I went into the boss, he was working with me and I, and right. I went into the boss and I said, Hey, I want to put Stan, uh, let him do the, do the shows on new year's Eve. And the boss said, uh, well, I told Stan that and the boss said, no, he's not ready. And I went in there and I said, look, the kid's ready. You got to give him a shot sometime. So well, we did. And now look at him. Well, your word, your word, I'm sure it carried a lot of weight uh, by you telling them that I'm sure they respected your opinion to give him a shot. And now, like you said, now look at him every time you turn on ESPN, he's out there in L.A. Um, doing his thing. But uh, let's talk about you, where you started. You grew up in D.C., um, not too far from where I grew up. I grew up in, in the Baltimore area. So I know how talent rich and, and, and excitement the, the sports uh, sports uh, thing is out in D.C. But just talk about, you know, your childhood in D.C., Bruce. Well, you know, if you look behind you, a lot of the banners that you have on the wall were all very important in my life. The University of Maryland banner uh, and uh, the Mont the Old Dominion, yep. you know, banner. Uh, Ravens, not so much because I was always a Redskins fan. My all right, I got you. I got you. <laughs> my father was the assistant director of the Redskins band for almost 20 years. Wow. And so, you know, I was very, and, and that's actually one of my very first jobs was with the Redskins. But yeah, I mean, you know, you, you know what it's like when you grow up in a metropolitan area like that and you've got teams. And uh, I actually started uh, at the end of my uh, high school year, my, my senior year in high school on the side, mm -hmm. I would go out on Friday nights. We used to play football on Saturday days. So I was off on Friday nights trying to stay out of trouble. And <laughs> I got a gig covering high school football games in Northern Virginia wow. for the Washington Post. Gotcha. And uh, that's how I kind of started in the business. And then I got my first radio show at the um, end of my uh, senior year in high school at a little AM radio station called WNIX. Mm -hmm. That was before they invented FM. Right. I had a high school radio show in the fall. And then in, in basketball season, I did a show called Terrapin Talk. And it was when Lefty Drizel and Lynn Elmore and Lefty. Tom McMillan and John Lucas were all playing. Oh man. And then Moses Ooh. Malone came in for a hot second, but then he went to the ABA. That's yep. another story. I heard but, about that. Yeah. So being able to, it, I would never be, I would have never been able to do what I did at such a young age had I not lived in that area. 
Yeah, I tell people all the time. I mean, trust me, I, I'm fr I'm from up there, and I, and we all know how the, the great athletes from down here. But growing up and seeing that at an early age and being around it, I'm sure you got an opportunity to get to get yourself ready for this area that had a, has a lot of talent as well. So talk about that transition from DC to this area. What, what was that whole experience like, and how did you make it to, to Hampton Roads? Well, what happened was that I had just finished. I was I had gotten an internship at ABC in Washington. So I was doing that. I was doing my radio on the side and I was going to college. I was going to Maryland and I was, I finished up my freshman year and I knew what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to be on TV. And I knew that there was no way that an 18 year old kid that looked like he was 15 years old, <laughs> long blonde hair, right, right. get a job on TV in DC. Right. And so what happened was okay. I stayed there. I stayed at ABC throughout the the entire year, which would have been my sophomore year. And then when I got into my junior year of college, there was a job opening in Norfolk. And so I applied for it and I'd never been to Norfolk, Virginia before in my life, never been to Virginia beach. I drove down, I did an interview. Uh, and at the end of the interview, I was thinking, man, I mean, do I really want to leave DC and come down to this little tiny town oh, I know. And, and work? But the job was there. Yeah. And I knew that, you know, sometimes you just got to strike when the iron's hot. And I thought, right. well, maybe I'll go down there. I'll stay for a couple of years and then I'll move on back to the big market. So I remember I did my job interview. And then the next day I called him up. I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I said, I'm going to take the job, but I want $125 a week mm. and you got to pay for my moving. Okay. And so they go, we got to think about that. <laughs> so they call me back and they go, all right, here's the offer. We'll pay you $125 a week and we'll rent you a U-Haul. Okay. And I said, you know what? I'll do it. So I came down, I came down here and I started working and uh, for $125 a week wow. is what I got paid. And on the weekends, I did the sports. Uh, and then Monday through Friday, I was a news reporter. And then when I'd leave at night, and I'd go home, I stopped by a local radio station in Virginia Beach, uh -huh. and I taped a sports show that they put on tape and ran in the morning. Right. And then on the side, I was covering high school sports for the Virginia Beach Sun and the Chesapeake Post and the Virginia Pilot Afternoon Paper, the Ledger Star, because I could live on $125 a week. I mean, <laughs> I haven't had You got to get other I, gigs, I, right, other gigs, yeah. Man, I, had to, I was getting any gig I could. <laughs> it, anybody that would pay me to do anything yeah, within man. reason. Yep. So that's uh, how I made the transition. And then, you know, as time went on, I mean, I'm living at the beach and the market grew. Yep. And I became... I became the sports director right. in uh, January 1st, 1979. Okay. So it was no more having to be a news reporter during the week and doing the weekend sports. It was my gig. I did it. Uh, our TV station grew to be the number one station in the market. And then I started, you know, pushing to do stuff, right. you know. And so I got in the car and I went to Washington every weekend and I covered the Redskins because okay. see, back then I knew everybody exactly. that worked for the Redskins yep. from DC. So I was the only person in the market that would go up there to cover them, went up every single week. Then they had their glory years, went to the Super Bowl. Well, since I was covering them every week, I had to go to the Super Bowls. So I went to the Super Bowls uh, with them. And uh, then, you know, Old Dominion basketball you know, got a little bigger, but what I, what I got into is ACC basketball. Yep. So I tried to figure out what was big in the market that no one was covering back in the seventies and eighties. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was mostly the eighties and then kind of getting into the nineties. And I realized that people loved NFL. They love the Redskins because that's what they were getting on TV. Right. They loved ACC basketball. So I, start covering ACC basketball games. Of course, Ralph Sampson was playing at UVA. I started covering all that because I had all those contacts from being at Maryland. Right. And right. they love NASCAR. So I started going to the Daytona 500 every single year. And then the other thing that was really big was the historically black colleges. So you right. had Norfolk State and Hampton University yep. and Elizabeth City. All three of them were in the market. And back when I started in the 19, late, later 1970s, no one covered 
nope. live sports. Nope. Like the Virginian pilot had an older reporter named A. Goldblatt. He was like yep. the oldest guy. Yep. And he would go to cover it. Well, I became very good friends with Harrison Wilson, who was the president of Norfolk State, okay. whose grandson, by the way, Rusty. he ended up being a pretty good athlete. He played quarterback for uh, some team in yeah. Uh, Seattle. <laughs> yeah, he was pretty he was good. Dave he was pretty Russell good. Wilson. Yeah, he was pretty good. <laughs> and so when I first moved there, President Wilson said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a hint. You should come to one of our football games. At They played at the Old Foreman Field at Old Dominion yep. on yep. Saturday night. So I'd do the six o'clock weekend sports and I'd go to Foreman Field. There were 10,000 people there, 20,000 people there. There were people outside, couldn't get in. Right. There was no one covering them. So I went in, I put them on TV for the first time. Then I got to know President Harvey at Dr. Harvey at Hampton University, who just retired. Yep, he did. So then I was doing I was doing that. So then I started doing the CIAA basketball tournament, which nobody used to go to and they're cover, but they would have 15, 20,000 people that would always go to that tournament. It was next to the ACC. It was the number one college basketball tournament in the country and nobody ever knew it. So I worked with the CIAA to get ESPN interested. Wow. And I remember the first big one was USA Today came out and they did a big article about the biggest basketball tournament no one's ever heard of. Wow. And he got national and international coverage, the CIAA basketball tournament. And, and yep. I stayed with them. I hosted when we got ESPN to come in, I hosted the pregame show and the halftime show, the postgame show and, and all of that. And uh, those were the things that I got into that really solidified my career. And, and, and like I talked about earlier, you're, you're, that's one of the main reasons why you're in the CIAA uh, Hall of Fame. You've done so much for, you know, the Hampton Roads community outside of sports with the St. Jude. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But you mentioned it a little bit, Bruce, about some of the people you've met. Um, you know, you talked about Lefty early in your career, you know, the Dr. Harvey. The, these are, are iconic figures, you know, not only in this area, but all over the country. Um Talk about some of the people you've met during your 45 years here in the, in the Hampton Rose area. Oh, well, I mean, you know, we, I, I don't, I, I, unless you want to keep talking. <laughs> it, like, it'd be kind of so, hard. Some of the ones I that, mean, that come to mind. 45 years is a long time, my brother. I, I know. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, some of the ones that really, you know, have, have stood out in my life, you know, and these were people that I was not like very good friends with, but right. people that right. I really admire. And, you know, Joe Gibbs has to be, you know, at the top of the list because I spent so, so much time with the Redskins mm -hmm. and, you know, he's just such a wonderful man. And then of yes. course he got into NASCAR afterwards. Right, and right. We had that connection. Uh, Lynn Elmore, uh, the great center at the university of Maryland, who Maryland, yep. went on to play in the NBA, went to Harvard law school, got his degree, uh, became an agent. And of course, a longtime broadcaster for CBS sports doing the NCAA basketball tournament. He was my roommate in college. Right. And so, you know, he was one of the first, you know, big athletes, you know, that, that I got to know very well. And then living here, uh, one of my best friends is Bruce Smith, the all time sack leader That's right. who, you know, has been my, one of my dearest friends in my entire adult life. Uh, Sweet P, the late Sweet P Whitaker, oh, was, uh, who yeah. I, I went to, I, I did a story on Sweet P before he left Norfolk. Right. He had just gotten out of high school never went to college course right before he went to the LA Olympics when he won the gold medal. And then as soon as he got out of the Olympics, there were four Americans mm -hmm. that had won gold medals in boxing and the famous uh, uh, promoter Lou Duva Duva. set up a boxing match at Madison square garden live on ABC. Mm. And, um, and I went to Madison Square Garden, and that was Sweet Pea's very first professional bout. And I went to every single Sweet Pea Whitaker bout around the world through his entire career. Wow. And it got to the point where I was working for NBC, but ABC would hire me to be the <laughs> Just ring announcer. Yeah, for real. They always knew I was there. Right. And Duba <laughs> would always tell the brass at ABC, they said, we don't care where Raider works, but every time he's here, Pete wins. And we need to get him here. And right. I can't afford to bring him here. So you need to pay him to come and work for you. Right. And then, 
And then what happened was then HBO started taking them over and I was doing the uh, ringside announcing, you know, for just for Sweet Peas fight. And then Michael Buffer went to HBO and he goes, look, this is my gig. You tell Bruce Rader to get out of the damn ring or I'm quitting HBO. Really? So I oh, walked wow. away. I said, look, you know, I'm Who not knew? ready to rumble. That's what I told him. <laughs> I said, I'm not ready to rumble. So that's your gig and you're right. And, you know, I mean, and the list goes on and on. Ricky yeah. Rudd, who ended yep. up being the Iron Man of, of racing. And then, you know, in more recent years, you know, some of the great baseball players like David Wright, mm -hmm. and uh, who I was just inducted in the Virginia Sports oh, Hall right. of Fame with a couple of weeks ago, right. and Michael Kedire. And, and the thing is, is that it transcended, it's transcended sports, but it also transcended a sport. Yep. Uh, Curtis Strange, who I knew when... You know, he was, we're close to the same age, and he's in, of course, the International Golf Hall of Fame, won back to back US Opens. He grew up in Virginia Beach. I knew Curtis when he was, you know, in 12th grade. Uh, and then, of course, the, you know, the great college coaches like Frank Beamer yep. and uh, George Welsh, who was at the University of Virginia, and Jimmy Laycock, who was at William and Mary, right, right. and all of the great players, you know, that came through there, you know, over the years that went on to have great professional careers. And, you know, like I said, I mean, I could go on. For so you can hours, go on. Yeah, it's, it's so many. It, yeah. All of these people, I mean, and, and these are big time folks, man. Oh, I know. Absolutely. Um, I got to give a shout out to, to your producer, Brian Parsons. I still communicate with him quite often. Actually, that's how we got connected again through him. Um, tell people who aren't familiar with how a sports broadcast is constructed. You have to go through your producer. You get story ideas. Real br briefly, if you don't mind, just how much important did, did Brian play a part of getting some of the stories and getting some of the scripts written for you to get on air? Well, the most important thing I think about Brian's career is that he was able to put up with me <laughs> for uh, 22 years. And you hear even, that, Brian? I'm sure I'm sure you'll watch and see this. So. Even my wife says, she goes, you know, a lot of people, my wife, Virginia, a lot of people say, oh, Virginia, she's such a stink. <laughs> and Virginia will say, nothing as compared to Brian. She Brian, said, yeah. most of the part of my day when I'm stuck with him, I'm sleeping. Right. But Brian has a weight. He has got to be awake with him. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the, the sports producer is certainly the backbone of the yeah. entire department. And sure. generally what you have is, is that, you know, in my case, I was very lucky that we would have a couple of all uh, our weekend, our weekend guy, which right now was is Nathan Epstein mm -hmm. and Craig Loper, who took my place. But when right. he came in, he was there for the last year before I left so that he could get to know things. But mm -hmm. Brian was always the rock, Brian, the producer. And I only had about four of them in 45 right. years. Yeah, I know. Actually, my very first producer was a woman. Okay. Her name was uh, Michelle. At the time, she wasn't married yet. Her name was Michelle Biddle. She okay. had been my intern. I couldn't pay her a lot of money. But she came in, and so she was my first producer that I was able to hire. And she was from Franklin, uh, Virginia. Okay. And she had the southern accent. And I'd take her I'd take her with me to Redskins games and all of that. And she kind of kept everything together. Mm -hmm. And then she left and became a news producer and a news director. And there was a news director in Baltimore okay. for many years. And for the last like 15 years, she's been the president and general manager of an ABC television station. Wow, good and for her. Michelle, the, the, there were some very nice tributes that people uh, sent in when I retired. And Michelle stood there and she said, I am the president and general manager of a television wow. station. And she said, I would not be here today if it wasn't for the work ethic and what I learned when I got out of college starting to work for Bruce. And it's because that sports producer does everything. Now, see, Brian, has he's reached a point, you know, years ago where he also is an on-air talent. Yeah, sometimes. So he does everything. And he comes up with the ideas what we're going to do to put the show together. Mm -hmm. And then he does a lot of the writing and he takes care of all the graphics and he edits the video. And then oftentimes he goes out and shoots stories and edits stories and does all of that. And then he'll fill in and anchor the shows maybe on the weekends or if I'm on vacation or something right. like that. Yeah. And uh, it's, uh, 
I'll tell you what, he's definitely a saint, especially to be able to put up with me for all these <laughs> years. And I'm sure that you know that he had a little health issue, yeah, had a little he heart did. problem, went into the hospitals. Doctors did a great job. And he right now is recuperating at home. But he, I've, I've talked to him several times and he's doing great. And he's going to be right back there well before football season starts because that's when that's when they need him. So it was very good that, you know, and see, that's the kind of guy Brian is. Brian had a heart attack, but he would never have a heart attack during football season. No, he wouldn't. Not football season. Yeah. Because he knew how important it was for him to be there. So he actually yeah. waited. He, he was waited. coming back from shooting the state high school basketball championship game, the last one, and was walking across the parking lot. And that's when he had the heart attack yeah. because that was the best time for him to have a heart attack, go into the hospital, have open heart surgery, recuperate, and be Come back from time for football season. That's, now that, my friend, is dedication. That's a team player, dedication. Brian, that's why Brian's the man. That's why he's the man. Um, Bruce, community service. Uh, I know how much important that is to you. Uh, I talked about it earlier about St. Jude raising a million dollars for that organization. Um, you know, being embedded in, in the community now, how much did it really mean to you to, to get into the get into the community and, and raise money and, and just be a part of the community as well and help people out? Well, I think it's, you know, one of the things that that I was told when I was younger uh, by my mentors is that if you are ever successful, the only thing that we ask of you is that you take some of that celebrity notoriety and use it and give back to your community. And it was something that was always very important to me. And it was something that I've always tried to uh, impress upon to all of the young people and even you know, the older people that actually worked in my sports department that, you know, if you're lucky enough to, to have this cool job and that people, you know, go, go all these cool places and people respect you, take a moment and give back. You know, one of the things I say when I give speeches, especially to young people, and this will never happen. I mean, it, it's impossible that it would happen. But I said, can you imagine if everybody in America one time one day a year did something to give back to their community, we wouldn't even need charities. You're right. You're right. We wouldn't even need it. Yep. Now that's never going to happen. Yeah. You know, everybody in the United States is not everybody is going to stop and give back to the community. Right. Maybe they've got reasons not to, mm -hmm. but if everybody did, so it, it puts more on our backs for those of us that do to do it. But it's something that I've always done. Uh, it's something that when I took my new job after retirement mm -hmm. that I impressed upon the CEO of the company that if you hire me, you got to know what you're going to get. And I am going to want to be involved in the community. Absolutely. And if you aren't willing to let me do that, then I'm probably not a good match for this company. And of course, you know, he was very, he, said, no, you know, that we love this and it's something that I'll continue to do. And hopefully, you know, my kids will follow in my footsteps and do that too. Yeah. That's, that's a, a, a I, I noticed that when I, when I was there with you at Wavy, that how important that was to you to give back and, and, and have other people involved in the community. You talked about your new gig, Bruce. It didn't take long. You retired, had a big ceremony for your retirement, but you couldn't stay uh, grounded for long, Bruce. Uh, talk about your new gig over in uh, Virginia Beach Studio Center. Well, uh, this is certainly not something that was planned. Actually, I was uh, I had been offered a couple of jobs to do uh, radio. OK, uh, morning, you know, morning radio shows. Uh, there was two two separate stations here that were that had come to me and made me very generous offers. Um, and then a lot of people don't know about. In fact, a lot of people that actually live here don't know about it, but Studio Center. Right. And if you went on our webpage, studiocenter.com, you'll see what I'm talking about. Yeah. It is a major national production company. Right. It started in uh, Norfolk, Virginia back in the 1950s. And wow. then uh, about 20, and it was mostly audio. It was back when radio were the big thing. Mm -hmm. And it, become, it became a very prevalent radio commercial uh, radio commercial uh, production house. And then our CEO, uh, Woody Prettyman, bought it about 20, he bought the company 20 years ago from the founder who was getting a little old and then moved out of Norfolk to Virginia Beach because he needed more space. And also then 
expanded into video mm -hmm. and now into web page development and now into social media because that's where media is going right. and what so what we do is we're probably the biggest company in america uh, that produces political radio commercials wow. on all sides of the spectrum. Wow. You know, Republicans, Democrats, independents, we don't care. If you can afford it, then you can be our client. That's right. That's <laughs> right. Absolutely. But, uh, but then, and, but also our, our video, we do a lot of television commercials for high end clients mm -hmm. and things like that. We've got some of the greatest editors and photographers. Uh, in the country that work here. And then one of the things that I'm working on more and more is content development. And, you know, it, the con there's such a need for content. I mean, you've got, what, 200 and some people, uh, you got 200 and some television stations out there that need content. But then you've got Amazon, then you've got Netflix, then you've got Peacock, then you've got ESPN Plus, then you got Hulu, you got all these streaming services coming up. Uh, mm. And every major athletic conference has their own network, the ACC yes, network, yes, the Big yes. Ten network, the SEC network, the University of Tennessee network. Right. And all of these networks are on the air for 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, and they need stuff to show on TV. And so one of the things that I'm working real hard, in fact, uh, actually in a, in a half an hour, we've got a big sports project right. uh, that, we're, that we're trying to finalize that you know we wanna shoot with the college uh, about their sports team that we will then put it together and then we, you know, we offer it up to the various networks and, you know, whoever wants to buy it, then they'll have it. So uh, right now, you know, so what, what I was able to do, what made this, this job attractive was, was that after 45 years of going in every day and doing several live sports shows, talking about what happened today or maybe yesterday or what's going to happen tomorrow, not being able to catch a breath. Now I'm able to actually sit down and be creative and produce projects and start with them and carry it through. Like this project that, that we're talking about doing today, yesterday was the first day we talked about it. Today we might finalize it. And it may take me nine months before it's done Right. before we can actually turn it over so it's going to be an interesting ride uh, i i think it'll it 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 was sort of one of those those jobs that i didn't expect was going right. to come up it did and uh you know my wife said are you crazy i thought <laughs> you were just gonna like so the thing is and a lot of people don't know this but i have four kids so right. i have 16 year old twin boys wow and right. they are juniors in high school okay and then i have three-year-olds Oh, twins a boy wow. and a girl wow that won't be going to high school for i don't know 14 years <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so yeah. uh i gotta put i gotta put my older boys through college right and right. then i'm gonna have to have some money set aside so that my wife can put the kids the little kids through college right you gotta, she puts me in the home <laughs> you uh, but, uh, you know, but this is just a great opportunity yeah. i don't know that i don't even know if i'm gonna be any good at it but, uh, you know, I'm going to give it a year. And if so, uh, then we'll keep going. And if not, then I'll just, uh, I don't know, maybe I'll learn how to play golf. Although I'll probably be too old to do that. <laughs> well, that's that probably was, in my job. I've never been able to have a hobby. I, because that a lot of times people for, don't understand this. This is a lot of our, this is our hobby. And we yeah, do it for a living. When you do what you love for a living, I mean, it's tough to have a hobby. Yeah, you know it, I mean? it, so. it, it is pretty hard to get any sympathy <laughs> when somebody says to you, so, you know, do you have any hobbies? And I'm like, no, you know, I, I just work all the time. I really don't have any hobbies. And they go, so you've been to four Olympics. <laughs> you've been to 12 Super Bowls. You've been to 30 Daytona 500s. You've been to, you don't know how many World Series. Oh, man. And you're complaining I, I know, that right? you don't <laughs> have any hobbies, you know? Yeah. We'd like to go to one of those hundreds of events one time in our life, and I'd give up golf. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> there you go. They say that. But, Not uh, the, so I think, right. but I think it was, I mean, you're a good asset because of the resources and the knowledge you have 
Um, Studio Center did a great job hiring you, Bruce. I know you you probably want to sit around a little longer, but hey, if you can get right back into the swing of things and get, keep yourself motivated and engaged, I'm sure you don't mind that at all. Well, I just as soon as he as soon as he gets back to work for a while, then I'm going to see what it's going to take for me to get Brian to come. To come yeah, <laughs> exactly. Brian, you know, he's, you know what he's going to say? He's going to say, you don't have enough money. <laughs> oh, a blank check for Brian Parsons. Blank check. <laughs> All right, Bruce, I, I, we got to run, but I, I got a, a last segment of the show called it called it. I call this keeping it real. I just throw some quick hitters at you. And the first thing that comes to your mind, you throw it back to me. Uh, do you right. have do you have the button that you can push it, <laughs> for I not for, the, for you don't want to answer? <laughs> no. yeah, right, yeah. This is real. We're, we're gonna have fun. It's real, real easy. Quick questions here for you. Um, you've mentioned all the events you've covered, and I'm gonna ask you one of the favorite events that you've covered in a, in a minute. But what's the one sporting event that you have not covered that's on your bucket list? Ooh, I don't know. I mean, I've done everything. I've done final yeah. fours. I've done. Uh, Olympics, I've done World Series, I've done Super Bowls, I've done Daytona 500s, I've done Indy 500. Wow. Uh, I've done uh, NFL championship games, I've done national NCAA <laughs> football and basketball games. Right. Uh, man, I don't know. What do you think I'm missing here? Polo, squash, I don't know, man. You've done it all, I guess. Yeah, I mean, Horse I mean, racing, you've Kentucky, done it all. Yeah. I'm Kentucky Derby, you know. I've been to Kentucky Derby. Well, I mean, I, the, you know, so I, I may be one of the few people that you've ever <laughs> interviewed. Hey, that might just say that that's I, and and that's why that's why you're a legend, Bruce. You've done it all, man. There's no wrong I, I, answer. Children, huh? Inaugur uh, presidential inaugurations. Uh, oh my goodness! I, mean, I, I can't know, even. Think. Hey, you've done it all. You've done it all. One of these so, one of these days, something will hit me, and I'm gonna email you. Okay, you okay, and I'll put it. Put, we'll put it under. Yeah. All I'm right. Sorry that I blanked. No, 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 no. That, that that's the beauty. That's the beauty of it, Bruce. That the fact that you've done it all. That's that's awesome. With that said, Bruce, what's the best sporting event that you've covered? Well, I'm a football fan, so yes. I mean, Super Bowls. You can't be a Super Bowl. You know, you can't. Right. I was on the I was on the field in San Diego okay. when. Uh, when Doug Williams uh, threw those four touchdown passes and Washington came from behind and beat the Broncos. Uh, I was uh, probably the, the, the biggest play that I ever saw that's memorable that everybody would know about is I was at the Rose Bowl when uh, John Riggins broke that tackle and scored the game winning touchdown when Washington beat the Miami Dolphins. Wow. That was pretty big. Uh, I was uh, in the old St. Louis arena when Bill Walton scored 42 points and UCLA beat Memphis State in Jeez. the National <laughs> College Basketball uh, Championship Thank game. You. But honestly, and you know, Brian, would, if you ask Brian, he'll tell you that I've always said it was this one. The day that, that Cal Ripken Jr. set the Ironman record. Yep, Camden Yards. At, yep. Camden Yards. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the game, he ran around the yep. field and high-fived all of the fans. And it was a magical night. And the President of the United States was there. Yep. And it was the biggest talked about sporting event. And the spontaneous reaction of what Cal did and I was actually covering it for NBC. Yeah. And after the game was over, I had to work and I had to put the story together. And then I remember it was, they, they put it on their like early morning news that came on after the Tonight Show and after uh, whatever the show was, it, it might've been uh, Letterman. At that night, they did a, NBC did a newscast. I was in my hotel room. I was laying in bed and I saw that story that I did and I went, you know what? I think that's the best story I've ever done in my life, there probably you. because it it made itself. Right. It wasn't about me. Anybody right. could have done that story. My three year old could have done that story <laughs> and it would have been the best story. But it was, honestly, yeah, it was, that was it. But then there were also the the ones that, you know, were memorable, mm -hmm. but certainly not anything that was enjoyable. Um, I was at Centennial Park the mm -hmm. night that the bomb went off during yeah. the Atlanta Olympics and everything that transpired after that. And I was in the, in the pits of the Daytona 500, the night that Dale Earnhardt died mm. or the day. And then having to, you know, it was Sunday. We had been, Brian was with me. 
and we had been in Daytona for an entire week and we were, you know, we were going to do the race. Yeah. You do it's you've been there all week. All you want to do is go home. It's Sunday. The race is over. You go to victory lane. You talk to the winner and, uh, and Waltrip had, had won, uh, Michael Waltrip had won the race, was teammates with Dale. And the accident had happened right before the end. Mm -hmm. And so it was in victory lane. And I remember somebody coming over and sitting down with Mike Wallace in, in uh, Waltrip in victory lane. He started talking to him. And Waltrip was not happy. Now, at this time, Dale had just gone to the hospital. Nobody really right. knew him. So I was in the truck working on the story about the race. Okay. And Brian actually walked in the truck and he goes, there is a rumor that Dale Earnhardt died. And I went, that's impossible. I saw that wreck. That wreck wasn't that bad. And he goes, I'm just telling you. And I said, Brian, I'm going to keep doing the story because we want to go home. Right. Go back out there. When you find out that he died, you can come back and tell me. <laughs> and about 15 minutes later, he opened the door. He said, Bruce, he goes, I'm 100% sure Dale Earnhardt died. Oh. And I you got to be kidding me. And we left and we went to the garage and there were people crying Yeah, and we knew. And yeah. so then about 15 minutes later, uh, they had a little press conference in the small little media room. A lot of media people left. Right. They gone home Yeah, and they announced the Dale had died. And we were up all night long that night. We did live shots for every NBC station in the country at 11 o'clock, we would, we like started it in New York at 11 o'clock, 11.05. Uh, we were, you know, in Charlotte and then yeah. all the way down. Then we did the next hour Chicago because it was Midwest time zone. Then we did LA yeah. and we did that all the way through the entire night. We were up all night. So there were a lot of very joyful and exciting moments in my career that I was there for. And then there were some tragic ones, but yeah. when you're in the news business or you're in the sports business on the level we were in, uh, you have to take the good and the bad. Would you say that was I, one of my next questions was, it was going to be your most impactful. Would you say that was your most impactful one? You think? I don't know. Man. I'm going off at the, yeah, at Centennial the Park. Yeah. That was some, that was, uh, yeah, I'm sure. I'm that sure. was some crazy stuff. I know. You know? Was. I mean, yep. that's, not sports related. Right. Exactly. That's yep. Terrorists, people yeah. dying related. That takes it to the whole oh, next right. level. Right. But as far as, and that, that was the same thing too, because, you know, you're up all night and then you're working all day because it's a, it's a never, it's a never changing story. And it just so happened that Jeff Myers, who was my photographer and I, we were actually, our hotel was two blocks away wow. from the park. So it wasn't like we just stayed, we just stayed and worked. And then it wasn't about the Olympics. It wasn't about the games for the next couple of days. Mm -hmm. I went from working on the biggest sports story in the world to the biggest news story in the world. Exactly. Exactly. Yep. Jeff Myers. I've heard the name in a while. I guess give a shout out to him too. He's, he's a great photographer. He just, he, he just texted me. He's the, he's the news operations director awesome. and chief photographer at TV station. He's having breakfast in Mexico right now. So he, <laughs> Good for he, him. He went to the Olympics in China. Yep, he did you know? in Beijing. Yep, he did. He, he did. Was just, he just got back from that. Now he and his family are down there, probably right by now. He's sitting by the pool having sure. a uh, pina colada. I'm sure. Good for him. Good for him. Good for him. All right, Bruce, I'm gonna put you on the spot a little bit on this one. You're you're the best athlete. Now I have this debate with a lot of people from the 757 area. The best athlete you put your eyes on that you left saying he's the best person I've ever seen in my life play. In any sport any or sport. just in the in our any area. Sport. Any sport, in any any sport, any area, what just that you've seen and you said to yourself, yeah, he's probably, he or she's probably the best athlete I've seen. You know, my son and I were watching the NCAA play. I were watching the NBA playoffs last night, uh, watching that uh, Celtics uh, Miami game, and he said to me, uh, "I well, I I think that I I I think we were uh, maybe we were talking about the Warriors," and he said, "So, um, Dad, top 10. Uh -oh. NBA players of all time. And uh -oh. man, that was hard. I know, Just, I know I mean, it was. was hard. I know it was. Because you know, he, you know, he st said, do you think Curry is one of the top 10 NBA players of all time? I said, no. no. And he said, what about guards? And I said, uh, or I, I said, and, you know, 
let's break it down to shooters. Yes. And then we were going down and I think we had nine and I went, oh, we forgot one. And he said, who? And I said, Michael Jordan. And he goes, oh yeah, Michael Jordan's pretty good. If I, oh yeah, by the way. <laughs> oh, by the way. So that's, I mean, that's really hard. It's uh, tough. You know, I think, I mean, you know, you break it down. I mean, you know, you look at Michael, you know, I mean, how great he was, uh, you know, um, you know, I mean, you know, even if I just go through the people I know, look how great in case Bruce Smith sees this, who's one of my dearest friends. I see him often. I'm going to say, Oh, it was easily Bruce Smith. Cause yeah. I don't want to have to put up with him. But I would, yeah. You know, right. If, 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 if he it's, says anything, but it's, I just think that I just think that it's very hard it is, it is. To, to pick who was the greatest athlete of all time. You know, for a long time, it was Jim Thorpe, you know, back when I was a little kid yeah. and uh, you know, in, you know, do you break that down to multi-sports players or do you break that down as what's the, is it, is it harder to throw a 80 yard touchdown pass or to, to hit a curve ball? Right. That's you know, true. Very, very uh, true. is it harder to break an Olympic record in a pool? Is it, harder to score 42 points than a national championship basketball game uh, when there's no three point yep. shots available good point, good point. and go and, you know, go 21 for 22 from the floor. Uh, it, you know, I, I think, I mean, I'd have to give you the list, man. I'd have to a, give you the list. list and then maybe yeah. I'd, I'd have to sit down and do the list and then I'd have to start moving right. people well, yeah, up. It, I mean, was tough. it, you know, what was it, you know, was it Kareem? Right. You know, I mean, I mean, there's just, there's just so many. And then, you know, the people say, well, one Kareem, it was Elvin Hayes. See? And, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't Kareem, it was Will Chamberlain. Right. It was right. Bill Russell. Uh, you know, that's just one sport. Yep. So uh, Michael Jordan, you know, yeah, who, it's Kobe, tough. you know, it's, I mean, it's tough. It's tough. that's a tough one. And I even when you, you work, I want you to work on that. When I watch uh, one of your podcasts. Okay. <laughs> You know, it's funny. It it's said. funny though. When, even when I ask athletes from this area, they have a tough time just breaking down the seven five seven. So you, let alone yeah, the whole I mean, country. Yeah, I mean, um, who do you, you know, I mean, who do you, do you say? Do you say it was Bruce? Do you say it was, man, you, you know, know, Allen? You know, Iverson? Uh, do you, you know, do you oh. say it was, you know, Michael Vick? Uh, you know, do you say that it was Kenny Easley? Do you, do you say it was Dwight Stevenson? I mean, oh, look man. at all the people that are in the NFL. The and you know, you football. just named you just named Hall of Famers there, and and we still yeah, have I'm, a debate. That's all I'm talking about. I, I know, and we still have a debate about it. It's crazy. What about what about Joe Smith? You Joe know, Smith, number one overall pick. Yep. You yep. know, number yep. one pick in the yep. in the NBA draft. I mean, yep. where does you know where do you put him in? Just in the great players from Hampton Roads. You know, Tough. what about David Wright, you know, I mean, you know, Mr. Met, yep. you know, the captain, yep. you know, yep. it's, uh, oh, it's, it's crazy. It it's really tough. is. Curtis Strange, two back-to-back -back U.S. Opens. That's the beauty of this, of this area, Bruce. I mean, we can go on and on just about the people from here, and that's the beauty of it. So many great players that we're shuffling them around and saying who's the greatest, and we just named who's who of athletes. You know what I mean? It's crazy. I love it. That's why I love this area so much. Last, last couple for you, Bruce, your Mount Rushmore of sportscasters, maybe the one, some of the ones you've looked up to or some that you admire or respect. Well, the late George Michael, because Michael, of the fact yep. that he was so close in DC and I really enjoyed watching him. Right. I, I would probably say Bob Costas, in okay. my opinion, were okay. close to the same age. I, I just admire Bob so much for all that he does you know, play by play of every sport, his studio work at the Olympics yep. and the in a, in NFL, uh, his great basketball uh, play by play when he was younger uh, in St. Louis, his love for baseball and how he does baseball, you know, that, you know, that that's great. Um, and his incredible ability to do an interview. I mean, if you've ever listened to any Bob Costas yep uh uh podcast i mean they are the great interviews you know i believe of you know of all time of course you got your vince scully yep. you know who was there you know doing dodger baseball forever and ever uh brett musburger who when i was growing up at that time i oh, thought brett musburger man. was the number one guy i mean he CBS. did nfl he did nba yeah. he did, he did everything. everything he yep. was he was like he was like the best, in my opinion, of that generation. Yep, and, was. you know, I'm a TV guy, you know, right. I mean, I'm 68 years old, yeah. but, 
when I was growing up, pretty much by the time I got midway through elementary school, I wasn't listening to that many sports sporting events on the radio. I was right. watching them on TV. So for me, sportscasters were the guys, the big sportscasters right. were the guys on TV. On TV. And, right. you know, so those are the names. So, you know, if I had to do that Mount Rushmore, uh, I think Costas would probably have the uh, the biggest uh, rock. I like him. He's, he's, he's an all-time great as well. Last question, Bruce. I'm going to get you out on this one. Uh, 45 years, we talked about it, Bruce. Could you ever imagine your, your life and your career starting out just a kid from D.C., now here doing what you're doing at Studio Center and your wildest dreams, Bruce, looking back on it, just to summarize your career, what goes through your mind after you think about that? Well, summarizing it, obviously, is as we talked about, being right. able to experience so many historic things right. and even some of the things that weren't so historic. You know, I look back, you know, like one of the things that always sticks out in my mind, Kenny Easley, mm -hmm. who went to UCLA was a, for the first because they had just started freshmen being able to play varsity. Right. First four time All-American at UCLA, number one pick by Seattle, mm. played an incredible NFL career. But the thing that I remember about, you know, in the NFL Hall of Fame, I, I went to his Hall of Fame induction. The greatest thing that I remember about Kenny Easley was when I was a young man and I still had a camera on my shoulder and I would go watch him play football in Oscar Smith High School wow. in Chesapeake, Virginia. That's right. And Kenny was the quarterback. <laughs> he was the safety. Right. He ran back kicks. He ran back punts. He kicked. And he was the punter. He played every single play of every single game. Wow. And that's the kind of thing that I love to look back on. Right. And one of my, one of my proudest moments on television was, you know, when after watching Bruce Smith play football at Booker T. Washington, but he was a lineman. And, you know, high school football <laughs> linemen don't get any publicity. <laughs> but he was the center on the basketball team that went wow. to the state tournament. Wow. And it was announced that Bruce Smith was going to go to Virginia Tech and play football. And I went on TV and I said, I think that's the dumbest decision an athlete in Hampton Roads has made. This kid should be a basketball player. He's a much better basketball <laughs> player than he was a football player. So it just goes to show you yep. that I don't care 45 years or not, that you're not always right. And <laughs> yeah. trust me, Bruce Smith never lets me forget that. But I, I know we got to run. Okay. But I'm going to, this is, you know, they asked me a couple of months ago, to do my goodbye live on TV, my last show. Mm -hmm. And it was the dumbest thing I ever did because you should never do something like that live because of the emotion that's in yeah, there. It's a lot of but emotion. I didn't cry, uh -huh. but I wasn't sure I was going to make it. But I wrote it. I spent a lot of time on it because I knew this was my last message. That's it. And I ended it with this sentence. And I also mentioned this sentence when I gave my Hall of Fame induction speech a couple of weeks ago. I said, the one thing that my parents had always taught me was always try to leave a place better when you leave Amen. than when you got there. Amen. And I hope that I've been able to do that. Absolutely, Bruce. Um, I know we got to run. I appreciate this, man. You definitely have left it better than you, know, you got there. And multiple Hall of Famer. So that should tell you something right there, Bruce. I appreciate it, Bruce. And I will let you know when this goes up on social media. Everybody's waiting to hear this. So... Once again, Bruce, take care, and I appreciate you, man. All right, buddy. Thanks for inviting me. I appreciate Thank it. Good luck you with soon. your career. You're doing great. I appreciate it. Talk to you soon, man. This episode is sponsored by La Vida Agency. Protect, prepare, plan.